Well, what you've got is a condition called the Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, rather a long name, I'm afraid. The Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome is, in a sense, the first cousin of myasthenia gravis, because like myasthenia gravis, it's an autoimmune disease in which the immune system uh, attacks part of the body. Myasthenia gravis uh, comes about because patients make an antibody against acetylcholine receptors on the muscle side of the nerve muscle junction, whereas uh, in the Lambert-Eaton syndrome they make antibodies against a target on the nerve side of the nerve muscle junction. So it too is a disorder of neuromuscular transmission, but it occurs, uh, as we say, presynaptically, that is, uh, it occurs on the nerve side of the junction between the nerve and the muscle, not on the muscle side. You need to understand that there are really two groups of patients with LEMS. One group, and you may come in this group, are those who are smokers, because about 50% of patients with Lambert-Eaton syndrome have an underlying lung cancer called small cell lung cancer. And as I'll be explaining, it's this tumor that provokes the response. And because most patients who are smokers and who get this cancer get it in their 40s or 50s, that's the age group that's most commonly affected. There is, however, a good side to this. Because the Lambert-Eaton syndrome often occurs two, th three, or even five years before we can see the tumor on the x-ray, it gives us a way of diagnosing the tumor very much earlier. And that, in turn, uh, allows us uh, treatments that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And those treatments can be very beneficial, not only for the tumor, but also for the Lambert-Eaton syndrome. The other group of patients have never been smokers, have no underlying tumor, and in them uh, the disorder can occur at any age from uh, early childhood right through to extreme old age. So two quite different distinct groups really, but the clinical appearance of the disorder in both groups is otherwise essentially the same. Both groups are weak, both groups have changes in the vegetative nervous system, which I'm going to describe to you in a minute. So in other ways, they're very similar. And you might also be interested to know that this disorder affects all races. And in countries where people are heavy smokers, then the incidence of the cancer-associated or paraneoplastic form of Lambert-Eaton syndrome is going to be a bit higher than in countries where people smoke much less. Well, most patients, in fact, virtually all of them, like you, first had a problem walking. Um, you remember you found it rather difficult to get going, and uh, I think you said it was felt like walking through treacle, and that indeed is often how patients will describe it. Um, and uh, later on, uh, they, you, I don't, it didn't happen to you, but in some patients uh, there's weakness of the arms, and occasionally there can be double vision or uh, difficulty swallowing, but that's much less common than in the first cousin condition of myasthenia gravis. So your difficulty in walking is in fact very characteristic. But there are some other symptoms that you may have um, and I'm going to tell you about those because otherwise you might not have felt uh, the need to mention them. But this disorder also affects what we call the vegetative or autonomic nervous system. Uh, and uh, some patients uh, with the condition, and in fact I notice that in you, um, have a dry mouth and that's because salivation is controlled by the automatic system. As you know, when you, you see a nice steak and you start salivating, it's not because you uh, are deciding you will salivate, it's an automatic response. Uh, also, and you might want to tell me about this, um, patients find that they get constipated. Um, having been regular all their, li their lives, they now find that they only empty their bowels once every three or four days rather than every day. And one other thing that you may have noticed, and that is that your sexual function has changed, that your desire is the same, but you can't obtain an erection as once you did. Um, and that too is part of the disorder, and I'll explain in a few minutes uh, just why. But it's important for you to know that because um, it's no fault of yours, it's not your psychology or anything like that. It's simply that the wiring that uh, looks after bladder function, bowel function, sex function, salivation, uh, is affected just as the wiring is affected um, that uh, looks after muscle function in your arms and legs. The 
To understand that, you have to know a little bit about uh, the normal way in which you make a muscle contract. You make a decision in your brain that you want to move, and you send an electrical impulse down the nerve to the muscle. And there is a very specialized structure at the neuromuscular junction, and I'm illustrating that here. You'll see uh, that I've shown the nerve terminal, and inside there you'll see also some little packets or vesicles that contain acetylcholine. And then you'll see there's a narrow gap between the tip of the nerve and the specialized structures in the muscle. You'll also see uh, here something called a calcium channel that plays an important part uh, in the release of acetylcholine from those vesicles. Uh, in a normal person, in a healthy person, the nerve impulse reaches the tip of the nerve and the voltage change that that causes allows the calcium channels to open briefly. That allows calcium to come from the outside inside to the nerve terminal and that in turn causes the release of about 30 of these packets or vesicles, each of which contains lots of acetylcholine. And the acetylcholine is uh, expelled into the narrow gap between the nerve and the muscle, reacts with the acetylcholine receptors and that leads to muscle contraction. So that's the situation in a healthy muscle. In the Lambert-Eaton syndrome, the problem is that too few packets of acetylcholine are released. The number could be as few as 10 or even 5. And a consequence of that, of course, is that much less acetylcholine was able to react with the acetylcholine receptors, and that in turn led to muscle weakness. Uh, so what the antibody does is to uh, bind or stick on the calcium channels. And a consequence of that, for reasons that we don't completely understand, is that, there is that many of the calcium channels are taken inside the nerve and disappear from the surface. So these patients have too few calcium channels. And a consequence of that is that when they try to make a muscle contract, the channels open, but there are too few of them, too little calcium goes in, and too few packets of acetylcholine are released, and the patient gets weak. So this is uh, an antibody-mediated disorder in which antibodies against the calcium channels here lead to a reduction in their number and, as a consequence, a weakness, as, as we previously described. Let me start with um, a patient like yourself um, in whom there is a possibility that you've got a, a small cell lung cancer because you are a smoker and uh, you've only noticed this disorder in the last year or so. Um, we, we, uh, we have evidence, direct evidence, that the tumour itself also has calcium channels in its surface. And we showed some years ago that your antibodies, or antibodies from a patient like you with the Lambert-Eaton syndrome, actually can block the calcium channels uh, in the tumour. And that says two things, really. First of all, it very strongly suggests that the tumor calcium channels are seen by your immune system as foreign. And your immune system is defending you by attacking the calcium channels in the tumor and helping to control tumor growth. So in you, it's an autoimmune response triggered by the calcium channel in the tumor. The second important point is that making those antibodies may help to protect you because it may be controlling the rate at which the tumor grows. So we can say uh, in you that we think it's the tumor that's been provoking the antibody response. But in those people who have the Lambert-Eaton syndrome but are non-smokers and may even be children who've never, um, who, in whom uh, one would never expect a, a tumor of any kind in, in, the, in the lung, uh, we do not know what the triggering factor is, but we've got a clue as to why they have it. Uh, immune systems vary between individuals, like the color of our eyes and the shape of our heads, but those characteristics are also inherited. So we inherit from our parents uh, everything about ourselves. And we also inherit our immune systems, and immune systems differ. Some people never get flu. I've never had flu in my life, but my wife often gets flu. So immune systems differ in the way in which they handle um, infection. 
And some immune systems seem much more liable to uh, develop autoimmunity or an uh, overactive response, if you like, than other immune systems. You could perhaps say that they have super immune systems and that they are too responsive. So not only do they make antibodies against viruses and bacteria which invade us, which is a good thing, but they also overenthusiastically make antibodies against bits of themselves, and that can be harmful. And that's why people get myasthenia gravis, because they make antibodies against the muscle astarconium receptor. Uh, why they get thyroid disease, they make antibodies against the thyroid. And in the Lambert-Eaton syndrome, they make antibodies against calcium channels at the nerve terminal. And a number of our patients who don't have tumors, uh, but who have Lambert-Eaton syndrome, have uh, one or two other associated autoimmune diseases. But there is something else. We assume, well, we don't know, that there is some environmental factor, maybe an infection, maybe something else, that is actually triggering the production of these antibodies. It certainly isn't a tumor in them, but it is something uh, presumably external and not internal.